Okay. Well, I appreciate y'all having me. I, I, I love uh, I love wood turning. I've been turning about 14 years. I started right after retirement. Uh, I'm 74, so I'm getting a little little long in the tooth, as as they say. Uh, and and I like making videos. I like doing doing teaching teaching videos. Uh, unlike a lot of folks, I don't like. I'm not into the fast forward with with uh, a loud loud music. I'd rather teach people something so they'll get something out of it. Uh, so tonight or this afternoon, we're going to look at turning a chess set. And my goal is to inspire y'all to to possibly turn a chess set. It is not a project that's beyond the grasp of a novice wood turner, and it's actually a tremendous skill building process because you're doing repetitive turning. And, and as we know, the more you do, the better you get at it. And turning a chess set gives you a lot of opportunities to develop uh, that fine motor control, uh, tool control, uh, emphasize the importance of, of sharp tools and all the things that once you've been turning a while, you realize how, how important it is. Um, I want to start off, uh, what, well, let me tell you what I'm going to cover today. We're going to talk a little bit about design because that, that's important. We're going to talk a little bit about wood selection. Uh, it does make a difference. Some woods are, are better for chest sets than, than others. We're going to talk about how I like to chuck the wood. There's multiple ways of doing it. Uh, but I, I like my way because it, 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 it has some benefits to it. Uh, we're going to talk about drilling on the lathe, which some people haven't done much of, but th this gives them an opportunity to, to learn to do that. One of the most important things, I think, for a lot of wood turners is uh, the, the, to take away for anybody, whether you're going to do a chess set or not, the importance of a storyboard, how you use a storyboard, and how important it is when you want to make uh, multiple copies is the same thing, whether it's uh, balusters or finials or, or uh, you know, any any type of, of wood turning uh, lamp, any, anything you're going to go back to and maybe turn again. Storyboards are very, uh, very effective. And then we'll do a little bit of turning. We're going to talk about the entire finishing process, everything from how I dye the pieces, how what kind of finish I use, uh, how I cut the cut the felt and how I weight weight the pieces. Uh, some chess sets don't have weights to them. Uh, the weights give it a, a very nice, elegant feel to it if you do play chess, uh, more so than just, just standard wood. We're going to start off talking a little bit about wood. Uh, lots of woods will work. Traditionally, uh, chess sets were heavily made in, in Great Britain, and they were made out of traditionally boxwood and ebony, and we know boxwood is very expensive, very difficult to get. Uh, ebony is very expensive and very difficult to get. And there's there's other woods, uh, domestic woods here in North America that that can work. Um, some of the uh, most of the wood chess sets that you purchase are made in India and they have access to rosewoods, uh, which, you know, are hard and, and very pretty. You've got to be very careful when you're using rosewoods because you've got to protect yourself uh not only from contact dermatitis for some people, but breathing that stuff. Sometimes you can have extreme, some turners can have extreme, or extreme reactions. Uh, we have an expression down here that says uh, there's two kinds of turners, uh, turners that are allergic to coca bolo and turners that will be uh, become allergic to coca bolo. And that, that applies to a lot of other rosewoods as, as well. Uh, the wood needs to be dry because you don't want it to, to move. Uh, the, the, um, the key to me is, uh, on turning these things, the start of making them all look alike is cutting the blanks in advance, cutting them all at one time and cutting them to exactly the same width. So unlike a lot of other tur wood turning where you just reach in your box and you grab something and it might be irregular shaped. If you'll, if you'll use uh, milled lumber, it really helps. And then when you can cut them off, you can come, cut them off in most instances to the exact size for a few pieces where maybe you're going to bring up tail, uh, tail stock support for some of the larger ones. Maybe you might add a, an eighth of an inch. But by, by milling the lumber, it really makes a difference. Now, the way I... Uh, let me show you this overhead here. The way that... Uh, the, the, the approach that I use is very simple, and that's using a what I call a, a screw mandrel. The mandrel is this round part that projects, and then, of course, you've just got a, got a screw that goes into the bottom. And for, 
the the chest piece, you're going to drill a hole, and you could drill different size hoses, uh, holes, but I use a three-quarter of an inch because a three-quarter of an inch exactly fits, if I can find some here, both the U.S. and Canadian uh, pennies, and I find just adding a few, whoops, y'all can't see this, I didn't have it switched over. Thank you. Yeah, catch, catch me. Uh, so let me go back up. So this is the this is the threaded or uh, screw mandrel, and I just I just cut it where it fits a tenon into a chuck, and then I have different steps to it, so I can uh, turn multiple sizes. So instead of having to measure your dimension to see if you've got it to the right right diameter, all you got to do is use the these steps as kind of a go no go gauge. This particular one is 26 millimeter for this one and 33 millimeter for that one. Uh, and you just use scraps. I have a box. Anytime I'm doing spindle projects where I've got a tenon left over, I throw it in a box because I use it for screw mandrels, jam chucks, and any number of, of things. So you have those handy. So the you drill the hole, and a penny will just go in there. And I drill the hole about oh, five sixteenths of an inch deep, which is just about five pennies deep. I put four pennies in there and leave about one penny uh, uh, depth to fill in with epoxy to kind of hold it in, in place. And that, that works for me. So let's, that's how that works. Let me show you how we're going to go through that process. So let me take, take this chuck off and put on another one. We're, we're going to start with the, uh, the drilling process. Now you can drill obviously on a drill press if you prefer that, but I found for me, that this is just a very fast procedure to drill on the lathe. So I'm using a small set of jaws to obviously to drill on the lathe. You've got to get got to have a set of jaws that works. Um, for for a lot of the pieces, maybe the 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 king and queen, perhaps not. Um, you could use pin jaws to to hold it, but for the smaller pieces, it, it works well. So we're just going to open this up. These are 35 millimeter jaws. I'm using a Tecna uh, uh, Nova, Nova Chuck, but any numbers will work. And if you get it in there right, it's going to be fairly uh, parallel, close enough for what we're, we're trying to do. Clamp down on it. And then I'm going to use my um, Jacob's Chuck. And I look at this thing to figure out how deep it, uh, five pennies is. And I don't remember. It's been a while. Usually there's something I can kind of glance at to see. Let's see here. Uh, it's almost easier to measure a stack of five pennies. But uh, So basically it's like it's a little bit less than a penny's uh, distance to leave leave on the back of this so I, I could mark it with a felt tip pen but I think this will work fine I don't like to go too fast on drilling somewhere maybe oh 500 600 700 for this size works lock down the the uh, tail stock and just slowly feed it in I use a Forstner bit so it doesn't wander uh, and that works fairly well and with dry wood it'll clear those chips easily and then you pull it out now here's the, the the secret sauce is once you have this in place turning chess pieces or you know it's got some of the characteristics of turning a box and it is a it tends to be a sequential process uh, so the next step is you're going to drill a small hole that's appropriate for the particular uh, screw that you're using on on your mandrel and it and it pays to have several of these uh, so you could have them with different different steps because they're fast and easy to make. So I use a hand drill. This is a for my particular uh, screw, and these are these are wood screws. I never knew about an Al a, a, a Robertson screw until I got into woodworking and learned the whole story about these square screws, which I think y'all use extensively in Canada, and which I really uh, learned to to love. So I bought a whole bunch of different sizes for woodworking before I got into wood turning. So I make a little, just put a drill bit in the handle, get the speed up a little bit more. And because I've already got that little dimple at the bottom, I just have to, to 
feel it, find it, and just go in there a little ways. And then it's ready to chuck up. And then you could go through and do a whole series of, of, of pawns. And, and I suggest for people to start with pawns. Turn 16 of them. You don't have to do them all in one day. But by doing it, you get that, that repetition. You learn the process. And you also start feeling uh, more comfortable. But the main thing is you get that process down. Now, because the way we chucked it up, even though I, I milled these things perfectly 90 degrees, the fact that I stuck it in here, hey, maybe it's off now just a little bit. So this is going to be the bottom of the chess, chess set, chess man. So I'm just going to come in here and just true it up a little bit. May not take any. Just a little bit. And now we're going to take that, take that out. So we're just going to And then I'm going to switch to my normal jaws because that's what I chose to put these make make these mandrels for. In hindsight, it might have made sense to to make all the mandrel tenons to fit that same chuck that I drilled with, but it's no problem for me to just swap out and put another chuck on there because fortunately I've got more than one. Now, you can't just screw that, uh, that blank, left it in the chuck, you can't just screw it in there because that screw is not locked down and it doesn't have to be. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this off. I'm got this, you want a nice snug fit when you turn that tenon. You want it squeaky tight. And that just gives it a lot of stability by having that, that mandrel that you want to make sure it, it is no longer than the depth you're going to be drilling. Maybe just a, short, a, a penny short of five pennies, about four pennies long, whatever that happens to be. Then you're going to go ahead and take your, your screwdriver. In this case, my square... Robertson and then you just screw it in to tighten it up and having that pre-drilled hole really makes a difference and you just keep putting it in until it starts getting pretty snug and you can tell you're at the bottom bottom of that hole and then I find if you just kind of twist it that kind of locks it in place so now you can see well, somehow I didn't get this squared. Maybe I didn't true it up enough. So let's turn it a little tighter because I can see a little bit of a gap. Take it off and tighten it up again. I think I made the hole a little deeper than I thought. Okay, there we go. Now, in these short pieces, you really don't need any tailstock uh, tail support. Uh-oh, isn't that interesting? I already had a hole drilled in this one, so now I got a hole in both ends. So that I picked the wrong, wrong blank for that. Um, let me see if I can find one that's just got one hole in it and start over again. That's what happens when you don't pay attention sometimes to what you're doing. So we'll get another blank that's already been pre-drilled. Thread it on there until it's fairly snug and then tighten it up a bit. I'm on my third chest set. The, uh, the first two were different. The first one I turned was the one that was kind of modeled in that article. And then I turn to the second one. And I'll show pictures as we get ready to start talking about design. So I'm going to bring up this short tool rest. And because it is fairly short, I don't have to be, like I say, be too concerned about uh, tailstock support for these pawns. And I'm just going to go ahead and take a spindle roughing gouge. You know, that's the, the C-shaped gouge. It's got a very weak tang that you don't ever want to use on a bowl. And for you pin turners, you appreciate speed. You want to get the speed up a little bit on this thing and just round it off.
Now, because I have this ground straight across, the traditional way of doing it, I can come in here and turn it up on its side and it'll act like a skew or a parting tool or a beading and parting tool and I can get it round up near the edge because I've got a little gap there. So I turned a couple of sets and I then I started doing these chest demos and I was turning different pieces, different color woods on every one. Now in this particular case, what I want to do is get this rounded and sized to that step. And once it's rounded that step, which generally should mean once it's just round, that's the beauty of it. If when you use mill lumber, all you got to do is make sure it's round and then it'll be the right diameter. So that's the beauty of mill lumber, Get it, getting it to the width that you want it to be when it's round. Once you get it round, you're pretty much there. Now here's where the storyboard comes in. And uh, one of the Canadian woodturners, I don't remember who it's uh, who, what his name was, he used the term preacher for a storyboard, which I, I found kind of intriguing. I guess that's because you got something that's going to tell you, instruct you on what you ought to, ought to be doing right. But you mark the features. In this case, that's going to be the shoulder. And the key to an awful lot of these pieces to make them the same is having all the features in exactly the right position. And then, of course, getting to the appropriate size. And the best way to get to the appropriate size is use some type of caliper, but it, it could be a lot of different calipers. If you use, if you take advantage of what you have, there's lots of other techniques that can help. Uh, obviously, there's, you know, a metal vernier cali caliper. That works fine, but you're going to be doing different ones. So if you can figure out what is the right gauge you can use, you could use something like this for uh, as a go-no-go uh, gauge on a particular feature. You can use a, a wrench. Uh, I love millimeters for these things because they're a little more precise. Uh, if you've got a set of millimeter wrenches, that makes it very easy. In this particular case, I want to turn the, the ball on this, this uh, pawn 17 millimeters, and I just happen to have a 17 millimeter wrench. I don't have a full set of wrenches that are metric, but I happen to have this one. So I can just kind of use it as a go, no-go gauge. And so I'm going to use, you could use any number of tools to take this thing down. Um, the tool that's one of my favorites is a beading and parting tool, mostly because it's a, it's a shop-made tool. This is a great club project. Get a bunch of uh, uh, folks together and make these because you can buy this high-speed steel in bars at a very reasonable price. Here in the U.S., I can get four of these on Amazon for, the uh, last time I looked, it was about $12. might be a little bit more now. Uh, and then you just turn a handle for it. And I find this to be a, a great tool. I can't see that pencil mark, though. So let's go back and take that 17 millimeter and say, okay, what's the bottom? What is the 17 millimeter? And then mark that. And with all turning, generally you're going to turn from the right to the left. Deal with this end so you have as much mass supporting your piece as long as possible on the headstock end. And that's especially true of, of, of chess pieces. So we're going to just turn this down. And I don't want to get too aggressive with that full... Uh, eight millimeter width or it could pull it out of the chuck so I want to do just a little bit at a time and then just kind of check it and then just bring it all down Now I'm going to stop it just a bit short of 17 millimeter because 
the way that pawn, let me grab one. The way that pawn is, you've got a little bit of, uh, of area at the bottom, so it's not going to be perfectly round, but, but yeah, pretty close. 17 millimeter to, to the, the collar here is probably just about, just about right. So now, because I'm going to have a collar there, and the collar is going to be, let me check my storyboard. I think the collar is pretty close to the same thickness as the sphere. Uh, yes. That collar is about the same width, so I can keep on keep on going to that. But before I do, I think I'm going to go ahead and mark it by making a little V-cut. And now I can go ahead and take that down a little bit right here. So the collar is going to be the same width. And then it's just a matter of picking your preferred tool. Uh, I like to use this 3 8 inch spindle gouge. That's my tool of choice. I rest my finger on top to kind of guide me. And I'm going to start at the middle and just basically turn a big bead. Now the first few may not look perfectly round, but that's okay. You can turn a couple of extra and throw out the ones that, that are least round. But this is a great, a great project for training your eye on what is going to be round. And that makes a difference on spheres and finials and any number of projects. Get rid of any ripples. And sandpaper can do an awful lot of cleanup. So at some point in time, you don't have to make this thing perfect. Because as long as you don't have too severe tool marks, that'll take care of it. Now, one of my favorite tools for detail work is, is a detail gouge. And a detail gouge, you know, different folks will call it different things. Some people will use it interchangeably with a spindle gouge. But in my mind, and, you know, based on primarily Doug Thompson, who sells Thompson lathe tools here in, in the United States, uh, these are both his tools. They're both three-eighths of an inch. They're both spindle gouge gouges. But the detail gouge is not milled nearly as deep. I think this is milled close to 50%. Uh, this is milled, I think, maybe closer to 20%. As a result, there's just a lot more steel underneath it. And by the nature of that flute, when you sweep back the wing, it tends to be rather pointy. So it, it gives you a lot of beam strength when you're hanging over the tool rest for cleaning up a tenon on a bowl, for example. Uh, but it also allows you to get in fairly deep. Uh, a skew uh, certainly allows you to get in deeper, but uh, maybe you don't feel comfortable with a skew. The detail gouge is the next best thing, but the skew is actually the best. So we're just going to come in here and kind of curve this collar a little bit. And then I'm going to switch back to the detail gouge. To kind of bring that in. Try to get rid of a few tool marks. And of course, you know, you can always come in here with a skew as a negative rake scraper and just kind of refine that shape a little bit. Nothing to be embarrassed about. Whatever works for you. Come in here. You got to figure out what works for you because what works for you may not work for somebody else and vice versa. All right. So next we're going to start that shape down to the collar. And here's where um, you could use something, uh, something like this. I got this when I started woodworking, these, these brass gauges, one-eighth of an inch and three-sixteenths of an inch. And the, we're going to turn one bead at the bottom that's going to be 3 sixteenths of an inch. So I'm going to mark that. Then the next one, 
we could either mark it. And I'm going to show you a couple of different techniques for that in a moment. So we're going to just come in here, round it over just a little bit at the base. Now, for these small beads, what works for me, other people with maybe a greater turning skill, they don't need this as a crutch, but I find a little point tool or a pyramid tool to be a tremendous tool for turning small beads, and it makes it very easy to mark the, the beads on the edges of it. Then you can come back and clean them up if you want to with a, with a spindle gouge. I could, I could actually use this as a scraper to kind of roll, roll it over and drop the handle and come across and clean up that bead. But the other tool, for chess pieces especially, some of y'all have probably watched Harvey Meyer and his Baskets of Illusion, uh, is using a beading tool like this. Uh, Ashley Isles makes one, but they, they, you can't find them here in the United States. D-Way has a very nice set. Uh, you just hone the top of it occasionally. This is a 1 8 inch. You just get that little fang on the left-hand side, and this... This is an easy way to turn an eighth inch bead. Now I can turn a bead, an eighth inch bead, without any problem, either using a spindle gouge or a point tool. The beauty of, of something like that beading and parting tool is if you're going to turn 16 of them and you want them all look alike, that's where that beading tool comes in and, and gives that absolute uniformity to the, to the process. But it's not essential. And then I'm going to come in and bring this in a little bit more. Now I'm going to come in. And now I can start that taper from here to the collar. Just, just bulk removal of wood. Try not to be too aggressive. Then I'm going to come in from this collar and just bring this down around it. And then I'm going to, basically turning a cove, drop the handle, just the opposite of a bead, like scooping ice cream. Come in with the, the bevel perpendicular. Now, I've got to figure out how thick that collar is supposed to be so I can look at my storyboard and measure it. And it says it's supposed to be 9 millimeter. I can set 9 millimeter, but the other way to do it is 9 millimeter is pretty close to 3 eighths of an inch. So I could use this little gauge as a go, no go gauge. Or I can find some cheap wrench and maybe mark it and have a set of these and write down on your storyboard what tool you're going to use to, to get those get those dimensions. So when I started making my third set, as I said, I was doing these demos and it finally dawned on me, instead of grabbing a different piece of wood and not paying a lot of attention to shape and using different kinds of style chess men, that if I standardize on, on one set, use go ahead and cut all my blanks, after a, a certain amount of time, I would wind up with a second chess, a third chess set. So that's what I'm working on, and I'm going to show you what this design is in just a moment. Now, they're not, this set is not going to look as good as if I did them all at one time, because there are a lot of variations every time I do a demo because everyone tends to be a bit of a one-off, even though I'm using a storyboard. But it might have been months since I did the last chess piece. So basically, there we are. So then, get a fairly coarse grit, maybe for the sphere, maybe somewhere around, uh, maybe 120. Slow the speed down to about a third of what you were turning at. And then just give it a little 
you know, a little sanding. Be very careful about not turning off any crisp details. That's very important. So you're going to come over the collar like this, being careful not to round it over. To get down in here, you're going to bend, you're going to bend your, your paper and just kind of move it around like this. Now, one of the things that I like to use, I was a little late coming to this, uh, this solution, but I like to use sanding, uh, what I call sanding butter. I've got a video on this. You can make it yourself. Uh, it's basically beeswax and um, mineral oil. And you put a little bit of this on your, sa your sandpaper or your abrasive paper. The beauty of it is, is it lasts a little bit longer. Uh, it can clog up. It's easy to clean with some more of, of the thing. But the, the best part about it, I think, is it runs cooler. If you're using exotic wood, you're less likely to cause heat checks. But it tends to absorb the very finest uh, dust, so you're far less likely to wind up breathing this. So uh, to me, that's the beauty of it. it. It winds up being safer. And just just work that in. And then, if once you go, and you, of course, go through all your grits, and what you may want to do then is take a variation of the one I just showed you. You add some, what they call diatomaceous earth. Here, it's, an, it's a mechanical insecticide. It's about the consistency of talcum powder. You mix that in, in the proportions that, I don't remember what they are, but I got it in a video. It acts, it, it's very similar to Yorkshire grit or U-Butte Tripoli, except it's, it's a green base. U-Butte Tripoli, I started with, great product, except it smells bad and it's expensive. Uh, this is another great club project because it's easy to get together and buy the ingredients in, in bulk and, and, and make this stuff in a, in a crock pot. Everybody walks away with some, the sanding butter and abrasive paste. But when you use this stuff, it just polishes it up like a, like a, new, a new penny. And I have not found any finishes that will... That, that, uh, that react to it because you're going to do it enough where you're going to keep rubbing over it and, and switching to clean paper and when you don't see any any uh, stain coming off of it then you know you've got it to where it needs to needs to be and you get rid of all those little fine scratches and you got to get rid of your tool marks and you got to sand up through probably about 400 maybe 320 but on a chess piece, I'd probably go to 400 and then use that abrasive paste, and then you're, you're done. So let's talk about design. Um, I want to show you some pictures. I found this to be a real rabbit hole that, that I went into when I started looking at these things. And, and I still g jump down that rabbit hole every now and then because if you go out on... My favorite site is Pinterest, but you could probably do Google Images, but Pinterest is, is great. You can find my... Uh, one of my Pinterest boards on chess men, but you can find all these different chess sets out there. And you can also go to some of the chess sites that sell them and find out what you like. This is a fairly simple uh, system. And you can see there's no, no beads on here. So how easy is that to turn? Now, if y'all got any questions, just chime in at any time. And we don't have to wait till the end. Uh, here's, I jumped over one. Here's one. Uh, this is more of a Staunton design but a little different we're going to talk about the staunton uh, design here in just a moment uh, this is a uh, 1930s russian style this is a small size uh, maybe for a traveling set this is a barley corn uh, from the 1800s this is before they standardized for tournament play on the staunton set that they were all most familiar with but if you're watching an old old movie something set in the 17 or early 1800s and they're playing chess, you'll see a chess set that looks more like this. You can tell how authentic the set is when you see the barley corn set. Uh, this one is from 1929 uh, called Barcelona. The uh, International uh, uh, Foundation of Ch uh, Ch uh, Chess Federation, uh, my French is not good enough for me to say international, i got to read it, I'll find it here in a second on my, my script. But anyhow, the International Chess uh, Federation, they have these international tournaments, and the host uh, country that's sponsoring it gets to come up with their own chess set. 
uh, and sometimes they they vary a little bit, sometimes they vary a lot, but they all have to have essentially the characteristics of a, a Staunton set that was uh, became uh, common around uh, 1847, 1848, 49. Here's, this one's a 1950s Russian set. I really like the Russian designs because I find them kind of interesting, and a lot of times they're very simple but elegant. In this particular case, again, notice there's virtually no, no beads which makes it somewhat easy to turn. And then the contrasting uh, finial on the, on the, the queen and, and king I find kind of uh, interesting. The, one of the things you see on most of the Russian chess sets is you don't see a cross on top. You'll see some other variation. Uh, this, is, this is the one that I'm turning now. This is called Baku, uh, Baku 19, um, I forget the year. Baku something or other when the year they had the chess set at a uh, chess tournament at, at Azerbaijan on the Caspian Sea uh, in at the city of uh, Baku and I really I just really like this one I, I love the uh, bishop uh, the very stylistic design I like the shape I like the contrasting finials on the uh, king and queen that alternate with the other other piece uh, and I'm going to show you in a little while the other reason I, I like the rook because they're they're very easy to turn. And this one doesn't have very complicated turnings on it like like some, just not nearly as fussy. Uh, here's an interesting one. This is a, called the Berliner. It's a modern minimalist design. These are all two pieces. The base is one piece, and then the the top part is pegged into it. But a lot of people are put off from turning a chess set because they think, well, the knight, I can't carve, and that's going to be very hard. Well, pick your design that has a very minimalistic knight like this that's cut on, it could be cut on a scroll saw, and you're, you're in business. Uh, this is uh, a, a, called a Bauhaus design from the uh, 30s. A, it's a Bundesform chess set is what it's called. And this was used, I think, in the 36 Munich uh, Nazi era uh, chess tournament. And it's got a very, you know, Nazi stylistic uh, approach. I, I, I don't like it too much. I don't think it's real pretty, but it's fairly easy to turn. I don't like that the bishop looks like a bullet. Uh, and I'm enough of a traditionalist. I The, the the pawns, I would rather rather have them turned as a sphere, but the, the style of this does make it easier for someone to turn their own set. Uh, this is an Italian set called Fabiani. Uh, how stylistic is that knight? I think it's just a really cool, elegant, modern modern design. And notice, almost all of these that I show you, they they staircase from large to small, with some variation, sometimes the rook is the same height as the pawn. Sometimes it's a little bit taller. Sometimes it's a little bit shorter, but they're about the same size. And then the knight gets a little bit bigger, the bishop a little bit bigger, queen and king. And, and that's one of the requirements of, of a Staunton. This is a, a pretty typical looking Staunton chess set. This is Cambridge 1904 used for the tournament in Cambridge. The one thing that I find kind of interesting about this set is it again the king does not have a cross on it, which kind of was kind of shocking to me for for a British set around 1904. But maybe Cambridge was very uh, moving away from uh, religion. I don't know. This is the first uh, this is the first chess set I turned. Um, I modeled it after one. It's hopefully it's the next one that shows up, but maybe not. Uh, this is the set I modeled it after, and, and I like the design. It was very simple. I like the fact that I could, I could actually make that knight without having to do a lot of carving. What I did not like was the bishop, uh, that is the uh, third piece from the right, looking like a tall pawn. That just didn't make sense to me. The other thing I didn't like about it, I didn't like the queen had no coronet, no, uh, no crenellations, nothing that really distinguished it. Uh, very simple design. Uh, I did like the cross on the, on the king. Uh, so what I did with my design is I went with a more traditional bishop, but instead of cutting the miter at an angle, which I found very difficult, I found that I could hold this on my 
my uh, bandsaw and with a hand clamp and go straight in fairly easily. And I added a small coronet ball for the for the queen, and, and those variations I thought were, were more pleasing to me, and that's the one I modeled my article after. Now, my second set is this Russian style. This is a Soviet-era design, and I just it was in green, and I just thought, well, that's just kind of a cool-looking color. The white pieces or the light pieces are made out of uh, Bradford pear. I tried some soft maple, and it just didn't hold the detail. Uh, Bradford pear is very common around here, especially after any any uh, uh, ice storm we might have because the branches tend to self-destruct after a few years. Uh, but it's a very simple design. You can see, again, almost no... Uh, there are no, actually, um, beads on here. The, down at the base, instead of beads, they just put a tiny little V-groove. Now, you do have a couple of coves on the, the uh, bishop and the queen and, and the king, but they're not terribly difficult. And the knight, I just love the look of that knight. It's a two-piece knight. We'll, we'll talk about that in a little more detail. The green pieces are, um, uh, well, it escapes me, but it had coloration, persimmon. It had coloration in the wood, so when I dyed it green, it just gave it this marbling effect, which I really, I really liked. So that's that. Now, when it comes to making your first chess set, like I said, you need to come up with a design, and there are some design uh, characteristics that, that are important, and, and let me talk about those a little bit. Now, the, the chess sets that I've made and the one I'm making is at about 80% scale of a typical tournament chess set. A, a tournament chess set, the king is somewhere between, oh, maybe three and three quarters of an inch to four and a quarter. I downscaled the designs that I liked to about 80%. With a full-scale uh, tournament size, the, the squares are about two and a quarter inches. It is a massive set, and if you put it in a room and leave it up, it needs to be a big room because it will dominate that room because of the size of the chessboard in those pieces. Uh, I'm never, I wasn't ever going to play in a tournament. It didn't need to be a tournament size, so I downscaled it. Makes it a little easier, faster to turn, and just more appropriate for, for me. So when you make one, you need to think about what chessboard you're going to use. Are you going to use an existing chessboard, in which case you want to scale it? So the, the diameter of the king is going to be somewhere around 80%, 75 to 85% of the diameter of the uh, squares. Uh, and that that's, to, again, in keeping with the uh, International Chess uh, Federation. But it also, as a practical matter, you can see the pieces easily. You can more easily move them and, and not have them bumping into each other. So that's an important consideration is matching your chessboard to the, the, the base of the pieces. Uh, the next piece is going to be the, the rook or, or the castle. And I've got a little video clip. Around. Can y'all hear that okay? Go in there and hit that line just a little bit. Hit that line a little bit. Now I've already turned the shape and now I'm just adding those little hit that line a little bit. The, the thing, thing I liked bit. about this this one is that instead of doing those crenellations. That's a lot uh, easier than having to drill and hollow the squares. Uh, all you have to uh, do is square scraper. A bit now all I got to do is mark the for the crenellations. I'm going to use the chuck jaws to kind of get this square. So I've got the uh, slot going straight up and down. I'm going to lay this straight edge here and come come across the middle, and then turn it 90 degrees. And Not real sophisticated on my measuring. This will be close, close enough. Close enough. GE, good enough. Use a tiny little file to start these uh, these crenellations. Now, I've since found, instead of using a little small file, if I cut a notch with a pocket knife, uh, it gets started. These don't have to be perfect. That's part of the even beauty of a handcrafted set. It's just a little bit of difference from piece to piece. Like kind of a course, then you come back with this round. It almost and looks like a chainsaw. I'm going to go very easy. Uh, uh, file, but actually it's a little coarser. It was a rasp I picked up at okay. some wood turning event for Part of the finishing cents. process on the lathe, I want to put a coat of uh, lacquer sanding sealer on here. And that just helps fill the pores, shows me, shows me whether I missed anything on sanding. 
and it dries very, very fast. It only takes uh, maybe 30 seconds or so. Give the sanding sealer just a moment to dry, then I'm going to come back with some uh, 500 grit. Just do a little fine tuning sanding here. Very nice. Might be and dry to the, the touch final, in, final in, in minutes, but you want to let it cure. And there's there's the the rook. Okay, I've there's lots of different bishops out there. I've got a got a box of them. Um, this is very similar to the Baku set, um, which I like because it has no miter slot, and and that makes this attractive to me. Uh, this is that that Nazi style Bundes Bundes form. It kind of looks like a bullet for a bishop. Um, kind of interesting, but I don't like it. This was my first set where I cut the slot by holding it with a wooden hand clamp and just going into a, a, a bandsaw. Cutting it at an angle would have been a little more challenging to get it just right. And actually, if you look at some miter, bishop miters, uh, the miter is actually cut down the middle, depending on the style. But this is the more traditional Staunton look where the, the miter is, is cut in from, from an angle. But the, the one that I really like is that Russian Soviet, the Soviet style, where they actually use that uh, Kremlin onion dome uh, shape. I just found that to be a very intriguing shape, uh, like the domes you'd find on a lot of the Eastern Orthodox, uh, Russian Orthodox uh, uh, churches. Now, that little part at the top might almost look like a circle until you look at it real close, and it's just really a tiny little cylinder that's being cut to a point. Just an elegant little, little tiny little detail. Now, let me show you a jig you can use to cut these things that I found kind of handy. I made this jig. Uh, somebody sells a commercial version of this, but this jig uh, I was easily made because I already had an adapter that would go to on a three three quarter inch coarse rod uh, for some threading jig I'd made years ago that didn't work very well, and then I could uh, easily adapt the one inch drill drill to to the thing uh, the the one inch insert to it, so I didn't have to do any fancy uh, work or didn't have to spend a lot of money for a very expensive one uh, one inch threaded rod so here's how that thing works it just makes it easy to th while the piece is in the chuck to just thread it on just thread it onto this jig uh, there's a rough dimensions you know your style might vary and there's a slot so that thing slides up and down. Here's an example of using it on a uh, rook box I was making where I was cutting the crenellations and I was having to make multiple cuts. And then when I, I just flipped it up and, and wound up using it as a carving stand. So that's an easy way to cut crenellations if you feel so so compelled. Let's talk about the, the history of chess. The only reason I mention that, you know, I bought a book by Mike Darlow. Some of y'all have probably uh, heard of him. He can uh, well, I've got to be choose my words carefully. He can be very, uh, get into a lot of detail. Let's put it that way. Let me show you his book. So he's got one of the few books out there on turning turned chess men. It's interesting, this book has six chapters, only one of which is on turning chess men, and then five of them on everything you ever wanted to know about chess and the history and 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 everything, but only one one chapter on actually turning turning chess men. Uh, he's a he's an inter interesting interesting character. But chess dates back to around the fourth century. They feel like it it comes from India, and and then from there it got popularized. It got picked up uh, by uh, traders along the Silk Road carrying those things on camel uh, from from India through the Middle East, and then uh, when uh, Muhammad, uh, Muhammad's conquest across, across the North Africa in the uh, 8th century, uh, they took chess with them. And so it spread across North Africa into when the, 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 the Moors invaded Spain. They took it into Spain, and then from Spain it went into, into Europe. And the rules that we know about chess were 
have been pretty much solidified with with only a couple of exceptions, as I understand it, from about the uh, 12th century in in Italy. Um, And let me give you an example for those of y'all that don't play chess. But I found a set of, of rules that was down to one page. You could find this on the Internet, but I just thought this was kind of fascinating. They're the rules of chess. I mean, it is it is less complicated than bridge. Just really simple. It tells you how each piece piece moves. The complexity is in the the strategy uh, of playing. So it can be a very complex complex game in the actual execution. But the rules are are pretty pretty simple. I never got past basically how a piece moves. Okay, so here's that Soviet era queen. I think this is again. This is these are made out of persimmon. Again, cutting downhill, like all wood turning, going on spindle work, you're going to go from, from large to small. And here I'm using that, that detail gouge, which is kind of pointy. This is a 3 8 inch. And here I'm just using to kind of hollow out, I'm using a spindle gouge because the size of the top yeah, of the screen is in the middle of the uh, Then I used a round nose spray for to kind of clean up, clean it up a little bit. Okay. And while it's on there, nice of course, it's a very small hole, maybe a one eighth inch. And I'm just marking it with a round skew. And we're going to use an eighth inch hand drill. And you drill. come in with that hand hand drill. One eighth or, or nine sixty-fourths. Right. Yeah. And again, all the detail is done at the tailstock uh, before you move, start moving to the uh, headstock. You want to leave as much mass as possible. Here I'm using a point tool to add that little. All we gotta do is do a little little sanding, and we'll be done. I could have used Completed a skew queen. on its side. I could have used the a fast way to pair something small down. Peeling cut with a skew. chase that one across the floor fortunately <laughs> that's pretty much the queen any questions on on any of that all right let's talk a little bit about finishing uh, bear with me here well Let's go back to design just a little bit. Got a couple more slides to show you here. This is an article. I ran across this on the on internet search. It was an article that uh, Rudy uh, Osolnik, uh, many of y'all are familiar with Rudy. Uh, he's got a, uh, passed away a number of years ago, very noted Turner. He was an industrial arts t- teacher at a college in Berea, Kentucky. And he did this article on turning a chess set. Now, he wanted he he was all about selling stuff, and to put his kids through college. So he designed this, and it was turned almost exclusively with scrapers, and that's basically the way they they turn the pieces now in in India. They're almost all scraped, and he created these scra- scraping profiles just like the ones in in India, which I'll show you shortly. Uh, I, I, as I recall from the article, he said it only takes six aluminum oxide wheels that you have to profile the shape on the aluminum oxide wheels in order to make these cutters. So you only need need uh, six disposable aluminum oxide wheels. So obviously this was a production production technique. Uh, here's an interesting design. Again, a fairly simplistic one. Notice on all these designs I showed you, the base, the base of them all have a common denominator. They might vary in diameter or height, but they'll usually have a consistent unifying design from one, one piece to another. 
Now, you'll notice on the night, um, it appears to be a two-piece uh, night where the bottom is turned and then the top is cut on a, uh, on a scroll, probably on a, on a scroll saw. And again, the, the bishop doesn't have the typical miter slot in it. And the queen doesn't have any type of, <coughs> excuse me, fancy uh, ornamentation. Here's the Russian des the design I patterned my, my second set after, except I varied on the knight. And we're going we're gonna to back up a little bit and talk about the knight because I kind of skipped over that a little bit, I think. So my first set, the one that's close to, looks somewhat similar to the one in the American Woodturner, uh, basically, you have to create your, uh, your patterns, and you're going to cut them out, and you're going to glue them on a block of wood. You're going to glue the, the face of the, the, the horse. You, and the key is you've got to get them exactly centered. You have to get it centered on the side. You have to get it centered on the front and, and glue it up with a little paste and then maybe wrap it up with some, some tape. Uh, and then you're going to come in there with a scroll saw and just kind of cut the profile. I'm not a very skilled scroll sawer. I'm, I never was into intarsia or anything, and it, it becomes kind of laughable here in a moment. But the reason you have both uh, profiles because you're going to cut it uh, on one profile, and then you're going to turn it 90 degrees and cut the other other profile. But before you you turn it, you're going to have to put that scrap piece back on it, so you'll have a flat piece to stay on the table while you're you're cutting it. And if you're not careful, it'll jerk this thing out of your hands. I think I might show that, how crude I am at using a scroll saw. See everything vibrating on the table? So there's the basic outline, kind of crude looking i haven't turned it round yet because i want to be able to move it easily on the saw then, uh, then you put it in your chuck now you just turn the base and you do a little bit of turning on the back side so you got that design where it'll just round over the back just round over the top of back side of his head a little bit And then you can either get minimalistic with the uh, the eye, here's me making a, a, a tool out of a nail to try to do a profiled eyeball, it, you know, it didn't work ex very well. I'll show you some, some easier techniques. Now, for my second set, I found an easier way to do it. I cut the wood, I made a two-piece set. And I made it the blank long enough, maybe seven inches long, so I could cut a night profile on each end. And the beauty of doing this is you had something to hold on to when you did the carving. So you just cut out the profile. Now I started, the first time I made this set, I was doing this with, a, with some carving knives that somebody had given me. I hadn't done much carving since I'd been in uh, a Boy Scout. Uh, carved my finger I think more than I carved the wood uh, but let me show you some technique here all right so let me show you an example so there's what that piece looks like uh, I haven't cut it on this end but basically you put one on each end and then you got something to hold on to. Now, what I discovered was carving by hand. Some of y'all are carvers, and this is this is easy for those of y'all not carvers. What I discovered was that I already had a, a wood carving tool, a power carver, and I I made. I've got a, a video out there and a set of plans on how you make a Dremel burr texturing tool so I already had a carving burr and then it dawned on me when I was getting ready for one of these demos it's like duh although I'm not a sophisticated car carver I do have a rotary tool I don't have a I was too cheap to get a Dremel I got a Black & Decker uh, knockoff but I've got this uh, get it here it's easier if I show you the overhead
is I had this high speed steel cylinder burr and 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 that's all I needed. With that, you can really easily do the kind of carving you're going to do for shaping the mane, shaping around on the edges, maybe shaping a little detail on the front uh, without any additional expenditure. So that worked out fairly well. Here's another example of one for the Baku set that I'm I'm working on that haven't made too much progress on this, but that's what it looks like on the carving. On this Baku set, for example, the mane is very simplistic, and it's interesting in the design. It only called for the mane to be detailed on one side. The other side was left unadorned. Just kind of, if, if I want to stay true to form, then that's the way I'm going to make it. Now... The way th that's going to be mounted, it's going to be mounted like this, where you just turn a little base with maybe a quarter inch peg on it, slightly concave this so you'll get a nice flush surface uh, and, and sand this perfectly flat so it'll, it'll fit well. And then you just, if, you just mount the two together. Now, for this particular one, I think you can see the eye this is what I stumbled on. The easiest way to make eyes is actually to use a tiny Forstner bit. Uh, I forget what size that is. Or, I'm sorry, this is not. You could either use a small Forstner bit or you can use a Brad Point bit. They'll give you similar results on something this small. Uh, I think this is maybe it's bigger than an eighth of an inch. But anyhow... Uh, I experimented with it, and then I drill a small hole in the center where I've already got that indentation. I don't have to worry about the drill spinning out on me. And you drill that shadow uh, eyeball by going down. Now, when it comes to details on some of these pieces, there's there's lots of different styles. And I played with the different kinds of of eyes because occasionally I needed an eye for some other item I was making, maybe a whimsical bird or a whimsical fish or something. Um, and so I played around with different things. This was that first one I made where I, I took a nail and actually used a, um, I forget what, I, I think I was using a diamond uh, Dremel burr or something to hollow it out. And then you could come in and it would kind of make a rounded eyeball. But if you weren't careful, it would tend to burn it. If you press too hard, it would tend to sometimes crack along the grain. That that wasn't real effective. Uh, but but some of this stuff's all about playing with it and enjoying the journey. It's not always the destination; it's the journey. And then I started experimenting with the Forstner and the Brad Point bits in different sizes, and that tend to work uh, very very well for me for these kinds of uh, eyeballs. Let me show you some other interesting style uh, knights. Here was one simplistic design I saw somewhere that's basically, let, let me get, I did this twice, let me get the other one that's probably, some of these, I was just prototyping it. So basically you're, you're cutting a, a, a cone like this and then you, cut it at, at an angle well that angle turns out it doesn't have to be 45 degrees but the first one it was cut i don't know exactly what angle but to me it looked a little bit like a pig i don't know it just didn't didn't seem to 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 work very well so i went back to the drawing board and when i cut the angle a little bit steeper i i got a, a much more pleasing design if you want to turn a, a, mo a modernistic style where you don't have to do any carving. Uh, so that's one way to do a, do a knight. There, this is a design from, I think, the 17th, 1700s, where the knight it looks more, instead of uh, being a traditional horse like we, we've standardized on with the Staunton set, they just made it look 
as some type of represent representative figure of a knight. So it's got a got a slope here on the front, which I thought was kind of an interesting design. And a variation of that is that I that I saw and I played around with a little bit was just designing the top to look a little bit like a helmet with a very slight cut in it to look like a visor. Uh, and I put a little ball on on the top to add a little detail. So. That's another way you can turn the thing with a little bit of shaving. This one, actually, I did a little offset turning. Um, there was a, there's a set of design by a company called uh, uh, Shopsmith. You know, the all-in-one multipurpose tool, very expensive. And, and it, was, it, it, it would slice and dice and, and drill and saw, and, and it was a lightweight lathe. And they had plans, and for their night, they used some offset turning. Uh, I played around with this, but it, it just looked like, I won't say what it looked like, but I wasn't real happy with that that style. I would much rather uh, do the other. And this was this is an example of that first one I played around with. I did prototypes for some of these things before I launched into uh, turning the full set. All right, let's see here. Let's go back to... Look, queens. Okay, let's talk a little bit about finishing. Uh, you can use a light and dark wood. Uh, you could use walnut, for example, for the dark wood. You could use any type of fruit wood. Dogwood would make a nice, nice wood for the light colored pieces. Um, uh, again, Bradford pear, real common down here, very hard. The one downside I found out of the Bradford pear. I didn't realize because it is a it's a lovely wood to turn. It's got a very tight grain, uh, very uh, a very nice turning wood. It turns like butter when it's green. I didn't appreciate how brittle it was though when it dried. Very hard, but when it comes to little details like the crenellations on a rook, if you drop it on the floor, uh, they have a tendency to chip, and more so than most other woods that that might be as equally hard, or maybe not quite as hard, but a little more, more resilient. So uh, in this case, we're dyeing the, the, uh, the darker pieces, and I'm using some transtent dye. I always use gloves, because boy, when you get that dye on you, it's gonna stay on you. Since then, I've started using Chromacraft uh, dyes. I like them a lot, but I don't think I had them at the time. So you mix this up. You can use uh, water or you could use alcohol, but they'll raise the grain. And here I'm just putting it on. If you, you have a lot of these uh, little spin, uh, mandrels, you don't have to tighten these things up. You can literally just screw it down a little bit where it's held because if it wobbles a little bit at slow speed when you're adding either the dye or adding the lacquer, it works fine. You can see here's a bunch of them. And then I took a board with a bunch of screws in it to kind of hold them while they dried. And here I am buffing it up. Uh, on my Beal Buff system. Uh, a lot of people don't like this three-in-one. They say it's too hard to get big bowls in there. Well, I turn mostly small stuff, and I find the three-in-one very handy for, for me. Okay, cutting, uh, cutting felt squares. My wife was a quilter, and she wound up, for whatever reason, she had a bunch of uh, green uh, felt. Uh, so I didn't have to go out and procure any. So the question is, how do you go about cutting it? And you can cut and glue squares to the bottom and trim them with a pair of scissors. But let me show you a more elegant, elegant way of doing it. You take a long strip that's a little bit wider than the diameter of your piece, and you just fold it and stack it. I would say probably no more than about six, six ply. And then I've got this flat piece of, it turns out it looks like ash uh, in my chuck, one of my skin, spindle scraps. I just pulled it out, faced it off. And then I, I cut a small uh, dowel, parted it off exa the exact diameter that I wanted with a little dimple in it and brought it up, kind of a compression chucking here. And then all I had to do was come in there and cut away the part that wasn't going to be left on the chest piece. Uh, skew works well for this, but I found actually after some experimenting, a 
spindle gouge does just as well. And I'm cutting off some of the scrap first because there's this stuff, it's hard to cut it perfectly clean the first time. I stop, pull away some of the excess and go back and do it again. And now I have six absolutely uniform uh, pieces of, of felt that I can glue to the bottom of the chest pieces. Uh, there's lots of different glues out there, but basically a carpenter's glue I, th I find works fairly well. But the one that I like the best, I don't know if you all have it up there in, in Vancouver or not, it's called Aileen's Original Tacky Glue. And it, it is very similar to a wood glue, except it's tackier. And that works very well. It's very inexpensive. I actually found it in a dollar store here, among other places. But I got turned on to it by a bunch of folks in a woodworking group I was with that did scroll sawing, and they used it because of its tacky nature. It was a lot easier to glue pieces together. So that glue seemed to work very, very well for me. The bottle may vary. You can get this on, on Amazon in the U.S., it's a Aileen's, A-L-E-E-N-E -E -E, apostrophe S, original tacky glue. And I find for gluing small wooden parts, this stuff works great because it, it's tacky uh, it, and, it, and it dries uh, fairly quickly, but it's just easier to work to glue small parts. I'm not a big fan of using CA glue for everything. I find that it tends to be uh, brittle for some things. I don't like the smell of it. Uh, Dave Ellsworth, uh, I understand he's now allergic to it. If he walks by a room where there's an open bottle, he'll it'll cause him uh, some uh, some some distress. So I try to avoid it. Yeah, it is very much of a crafter's kind of glue. Uh, that tech that technique for cutting uh, felt. I had an engineer friend of mine in the neighborhood, a neighbor, uh, who was restoring a, an old Studebaker, and he, he needed to replace the round glass, whatever you call it, cover on one of his odometer uh, instrument, on his instrument panel. And so he'd gotten some plexiglass, but he could not figure out how to cut it round. He couldn't use a hole saw because it would put a hole in the middle. You couldn't cut it. He didn't have a scroll saw, and it had been really tough to get it perfectly around. So I had him uh, bring it over, and I did it the same way I did that felt. I just made uh, a backer plate and then made a took one of my spindle scraps of the appropriate size, sized it to the size that he wanted cut, brought it up as a, as a friction chuck, and then used a thin parting tool along the edge of that, that wooden backer plate and just cut it out you know, quicker than anything. He was he was absolutely amazed. <laughs> Lots of different things. You know, when you're wood turner, uh, that old saying, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? <laughs> now, let me show you. I, I, I copied this. It's probably effective on very, very hard, dense wood like the rosewoods that they use over there. So they can get a very nice surface uh, with, with a scraper. Uh, some of y'all may be familiar with uh, Bill Jones, uh, who passed away, oh, I think in the early 90s, uh, who was a fourth generation bone grubber, ivory turner, and th most of the ivory was, was scraped. And it's kind of like for some of you pen turners that use, uh, that, that use acrylic, you realize that the carbide works very well on, on, on acrylic. I don't think it works all that well on wood, but that's... I'm a, maybe a bit of a traditionalist uh, there. Uh, let's see. I think I've got one of these things on. Ooh. Yep. Um, let's see what else. All right, let me check my notes here, see what I I have not covered. 
design 78% clips Soviet era bishops, queen, king, sending trans tent die felting. Okay, so, uh, you know, th th there's a joke about a guy that had to write a book review for uh, a, a magazine or, or a newspaper, and it was about penguins. And after he read the book, he had a hard time putting words to the paper. About the only thing he could come up with was, this book tells you more than you ever wanted to know about penguins. <laughs> so so maybe this demonstration uh, it is told you more about turning chess set than you ever want to know, but hopefully it, it's given you some uh, additional uh, tips and techniques that you might apply to other work and, and hopefully inspired you to, to maybe turn a, a, a chess set. Uh, then we get to the chess board. Let me, let me get to that. Let me find it here, off screen. I'm getting there. Okay. So the technique that, that I thought I would use to do something a little bit different is called a Zentangle. Some of y'all might be familiar with that. It's, it's typically used with inks, but you can also use it with pyrography. Uh, and it's basically a form of doodling. Uh, this is an example of how you could do that kind of doodling on the rim of a platter. So what has that got to do with chess, turning a chess set? Well, when it came to making a chess board, I decided instead of making a traditional chess board, which looked like it was going to be an awful lot of work, I would use a technique that I had used it with wood turning. And I laid out the, a grid and just did a doodling zentangle pattern on all the dark pieces and then I did a little border with different zen zen doodles about four or five six inches long before I changed to a different pattern uh, I used a piece of oh sub quarter inch Baltic birch uh, drawer bottom panel I got from the local sawmill or uh, wood mill and it was already lacquered on one side to make it real easy for for uh, cabinet makers to use for drawer panels and I just flipped it over and put the raw side up and the lacquered side down and Zen tangled it and then put a few coats of lacquer on it and and there I was and then Bob's your uncle as they say uh, My next set that I made that I'm working on now that's that's a few of the prototype a few pieces for this Baku set, but I made this uh, chess box uh, to hold the pieces and I used a book matched piece of spalted uh, spalted uh, sycamore for the top and that's a more of a traditional board that I made uh, for the bottom and then after that I figured I would not be making any more chess boards and because of my issues I've got with my back and a little bit of balance I decided I'd start cleaning out things I didn't need in my shop every day so I got rid of my after this my jointer my planer and my chop saw figuring all they were doing is getting in the way and creating more of a trip hazard and i've got friends that got joiners and planers I, if i make decide to make another chess board i can always go over to their place and and use the use their 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 parts uh, i want to show you some detail on the all right for the king and queen We've got a little round ball for the queen and an elongated uh, piece for the king. Let me show you some other ways that you can decorate. Here's an example of, again, how you can transfer things from one project to another. These are some Christmas tree ornaments. So you shape the outline of an, of an angel or a star. Not a very good star. I was still playing with it. But you take that same concept, and that is how you go about uh, creating that, what they call a cross pate on the king. Uh, let me find one over here, and I can show you exactly what I'm talking about. 
So basically, you just turn a disc with this, the, the, the little round tenon or cylinder that, that protrudes and make it the same diameter on both sides of the disc. And then all you got to do, and there's, here's two of them, all you got to do is either chisel it off with a grain, which is probably not the best technique, but use a flush cut saw. Or if you got a sander that could get to that, you could sand it flat. But I find a flush cut saw. And then, and then what works for me is you get a piece of uh, substrate like MDF. Put a sheet of uh, uh, glue, uh, spray glue, and put a piece of sandpaper on it. And then you can smooth it out. You can get it absolutely fl uh, flat by using, using that, that technique. Now, when, once you start going down the rabbit hole doing research, you find you, you'll you'll find the different tops that some of these kings have, and they don't all have to be turned as part of the piece. Just like you know, a contrasting wood, you just drill a small hole and and make the matching uh, tenon. What I found on the more elegant pieces, the higher end pieces, the cross pate normally looked more like a Maltese cross that generally had this little tiny, tiny little uh, ball at the top. And it normally, they normally have a, uh, a bead at the bottom. So you just turn these as separate pieces and then, and then add them. And then the, the, the Cambridge the style and some of the Russian ones where they look like they have rocket ships on top of different shapes and profiles. That's just another way to embellish the top if you're not interested in, in putting a, a cross, cross pate. Basically, it, it, at the end, you just glue in the pennies. And the pennies for, for weight, it just gives it a really nice, elegant balance. Traditionally, they used lead, of course. But nowadays, you know, there's all kinds of issues with, with using lead. Very difficult for the folks from India to import uh, chess sets with lead pieces in it because they feel like the risk of some kids gnawing off the end of it or something. But what they do in India is they tend to use a piece of uh, iron, like an iron rebar, and they just cut off a little uh, length of slug uh, if they want to add weight and use steel. Uh, copper actually has a higher specific gravity than steel, so it, it's actually heavier uh, pound for pound, I think. So four pennies just adds just enough. You could add, drill them a little deeper and add a fifth or six penny if you wanted for the, the larger pieces like the king or queen, but you've got a little e extra wood. Four pennies uniformly throughout your set I think works fine, but, you know, it's... it's Do y'all do y'all not do y'all not use pennies anymore? Wow. Well, next time you visit, next time you visit the states, next time you visit the states. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, come to the states, and when you go to a cash register, there's there, there's normally that little uh, little uh, uh, cup there that says, "If you have one, uh, leave one. If you need one, take one." But don't, but don't get them all in one place. Oh, gracious. Well, I guess we're still pinching pennies over here. I mentioned a couple of club club projects. If y'all get together, I'll mention them again. Uh, you know, there's making tools is a great project, and again, this this uh, beating and parting tool is is a tool that I use all the time for making tenons because generally, no matter how big a tenon you want to make, you can do it in one pass. Whereas if you're using a quarter inch or uh, an eighth of an inch, you got to take multiple passes and and join it up and and this works well. And like I say, it's very inexpensive and it's high-speed steel because it's used in the metal industry as a cutting tool, a parting tool. Uh, so you can usually get them in sets of four, or I bought them sometimes in sets of ten. 
we'll do this. We'll have a club workshop about every 18 months and and have the participants turn a handle and uh, make a beating and parting tool. The ferrule on this, anybody figure out what that ferrule is? Can you recognize it? It's the outside race of a uh, of a bearing, a ball bearing. It's the same bearings that I use on my bandsaw. Uh, and I bought a set of 10, uh, 10 of them for about 10 bucks or so off of Amazon because I had to replace all the bearings of my bandsaw because they all got fouled with with dust because they were shield, shielded but not sealed. <laughs> so I had a bunch of ball bearings to use. And then for the inner race, I use that for, uh, let's see if I've got it on this one. Nope, I don't have it here. I use it for making awls. It makes a very, the inner race makes a very nice, uh, attractive ferrule on an awl. Then the other one is uh, you buy these high-speed steel in either a quarter inch or six six millimeter or seven millimeter even. I wouldn't go bigger than that. And this is just a wonderful tool, especially if you do thread chasing, box making, uh, making V cuts for, for burn ring. They're very inexpensive to make. All you got to do is put a handle on it. That, that makes a nice club project. And then there's that uh, abrasive paste and and uh, sanding butter, which is a nice uh, workshop. We normally do that as a side. We'll be working on some other project, and we'll find one member that can kind of oversee that operation and still have time to turn because it's, it's not real complicated, and it's very inexpensive, much cheaper than buying Yorkshire Grit or U-Butte Triple E. Uh, the sanding butter is basically uh, beeswax and mineral oil, and it's a ratio, if I recall, it's about four to one by weight. And then for the abrasive paste, you add an, an additional part of this diatomaceous earth, which is basically the fossilized remains of uh, diatoms, which is some kind of sea creature that, that died millions of years ago. It's basically the same product you find in your Triple E if you're using a buffing system. Uh, Triple E comes, they named it Triple E because it was mined in Triple E and that color happens to be red. Other parts of the world, it might be some other color based on the minerals uh, of the fossilized rem remains. Here, the diatomaceous earth is a mechanical insecticide, so you can get it in a, you know, like a, I don't know, 10 pound sack for. 10 or 12 bucks it's not real expensive and it'll last you it'll last you forever but but you spread it around in the corners and cockroaches and other critters when they walk through it they get it on their exoskeleton and it it chews holes in them and then they dehydrate and die <laughs> you can you can it's it's it doesn't hurt you to touch it it doesn't hurt you to taste it uh is if you got a uh what they call a pharmaceutical grade you don't want to breathe it because it's very nasty stuff because it's got all these really super sharp ed, uh, edges to it in these little powders, but it looks like talcum powder. It's just, you can blow it and it'll go everywhere. So you want to be very careful of your re respiration when you're making this stuff. It's basically the same stuff that you're going to find in U -Bute, Butte Tripoli or uh, Yorkshire Grit. I think Yorkshire Grit might also have an additional uh little coarser grade pumice as well so it'll cut a little faster but but it breaks down as you use it uh and it just it's just a marvelous product like i say everybody seems to be concerned about uh using either one of these affecting the finish i've had nobody ever say they've had a problem as long as you get rid of the excess and don't leave you know lots of wax on the uh, on the exterior it 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 doesn't react with polyurethane or antique oil or anything because most anything with a solvent is going to dissolve that wax in any case no i i use diatomaceous earth well like i say there's two different products yeah the the butter is used primarily for sanding and uh up for, for all your grits, 
uh, and then the diatomaceous, uh, the, the abrasive paste is used as the final finish, not the final finish, but the final uh, a, a part of my sanding protocol to get rid of any micro scratches left by the 320 uh, or 280 or 400 grit. It gets rid of those fine scratches. It's not a finish. It's got wax in it. looks shiny when you finish, but it won't last. You've got to still come back with some type of finish on top. My my finish of choice for almost everything is Minwax antique oil, but uh, there there are you know some people like lacquer. I don't like to spray uh, in my shop because of the fumes, but you know there's lots of anything will go on top of it. Uh, the ratio is is about one part of butter. Or, or one part of, of beeswax, one part of diatomaceous earth, and four parts of mineral oil uh, by weight. You you weigh it. You don't you don't use the mineral oil and 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 measure it out in in volume. You you do it use postal scales and measure all of them out. You might have to vary your compound a little bit to get the consistency you want because there is some variation in in beeswax and uh, and and mineral oil, but generally that there's that ratio. I've got a couple of videos out there on using uh, what they call sanding lubricant. I did an article for American Woodturner some years ago on on using uh, sanding lubricant. That's what they call this. You can use other things for sanding lubricant. You can use uh, uh, walnut. You can use finishing oil. You can use walnut oil. You can use water. Uh, they all work to different different degrees depends on wh what you like i just i like the sanding sanding butter uh, the mystery to me is how you can take something that's almost a yellow or creamy color like this you add what looks to be a white talcum powder to it and it winds up looking like this for the abrasive paste it turns a dark brownish green uh, don't understand the color change but yeah, I've got some videos out there on it, on making it. Anything else? All right. Well, I think we're probably coming to a conclusion, um, unless somebody's got some other questions. Now, I'm going to be around here for a few minutes cleaning up my shop, so I will leave the Zoom session uh, open if anybody... I've got another another question while I'm around for a few minutes kind of cleaning up. But thank you all for having me. I appreciate it.